I'm John Henry, and I'm the chairman of the Committee for the Republic. Tonight's guest is journalist, author, and my friend, Andrew Coburn. The Committee for the Republic uh, and Andrew share the same interest in the warfare state, too big to fail banks, and Israel. We had a salon for Andrew's biography of, of Donald Rumsfeld at the height of the Iraq war. The committee had a second salon for Andrew's drone book, um, which came out during the uptick, uptick in the Africa, <clears throat> Afghanistan bombing campaign of uh, Obama's good war. Our third salon for Andrew tonight is for his recent book, Spoils of War. And if you haven't read it, uh, here it is. It's a collection of um, essays that Andrew has written for Harper's and over the years, and it's uh, uh, you'll hear all about it tonight. Uh, we love the fact that Andrew uh, tells it like it is. There's no corruption, it seems, which escapes Andrew's eagle eyes, and we can always count on him to follow the money. Andrew's investigative journalism sets high standards. Thomas Jefferson made the interesting observation, and I quote, were it left to me, Jefferson said, to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. If journalists investigate and report the truth without ulterior motives or biases, Jefferson believed people can be trusted to digest information and act responsibly. Exposing the Watergate crimes was more the handiwork of the press than of prosecutors or Congress. A government without newspapers, by contrast, would immediately plunge us into tyranny. Uh, we don't want to live in Putin's Russia or Xi's China. However, when the fourth branch becomes a cheerleader for the American empire, it doesn't deter government wrongdoing. By and large, our mainstream media doesn't bat an eye in transmitting the lies and deceptions of the deep state. Andrew is the rare journalist who, that does his job He's a breath of fresh air. We can believe him. Uh, Andrew is very believable. Andrew's investigative reporting exposes the staggering corruption, incompetence, waste, and follies of the multi trillion dollar military industrial security. Among other things, 800 military bases have brought, and that's not counting lily pads, special forces in virtually every country in the world, perpetual pointless presidential wars, profit, profiteering, dysfunctional weapons, chronic threat inflation, and annual, an annual hyper bloated military spending surpassing $1 trillion. Andrew traces the consequence, consequences of the self-aggrandizing and detestable rot of our imperial presidency. All history proves Lord Acton's dictum that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Add mammon to the equation and the soreness worsens. Andrew chronicles the merger of power and money. The Constitutional's framers intended Congress to arrest the evils Andrew unearths with exacting oversight. Sunshine is the best disinfectant, the electric light, the most efficient policeman. But Congress is AOL. The Pentagon's books go unaudited. Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld disclosed that a staggering $3 trillion in defense spending could not be accounted for. And Congress no longer support, supports Fulbright's churches, two senators I had the um, great pleasure of working for, and, and or Proxmires to oppose illegal wars and Pentagon waste. 
But let's not despair. We have Andrew Coburn to unearth wrongdoing and seek accountability. Andrew, uh, turn it over to you. It's all yours. Well, I don't know. It's a hard. That's a hard uh, introduction to follow, um, uh, John. Thank you very much. Uh, I feel a little bit <coughs> a bit embarrassed to the, you know, pull some comments, but thank you anyway. I think. Um, I mean, it's very. In, in this book, as you say, it's a collection of essays I've written over the last few years, predominantly about defense for Harper's Magazine, um, a great organ that allows me the freedom to write pretty much like as I want. Um, and <clears throat> there's a basic theme to it. I mean, the basic theme is defense and is, is um, the, the title is kind of a giveaway because I regard the war certainly as war and defense as being practiced by our current military establishment as um, as really all about the spoils. Um, you know, it always amazes me how much learned commentary we hear these days about our political system, the body politic, without the subject of money ever coming up. And yet, to me, it seems so obvious that the only only most obvious explanation of the why our system behaves as it does. And I'm talking particularly about our military system, our defense system, but it could apply, uh, apply a, a number of areas, is for personal the pursuit of personal profit. And <clears throat> I was very delighted some years ago to um, realize that I'm certainly, I didn't expect to be original in this, um, in this view, but I uh, have a very distinguished uh, pre predecessor in this <clears throat> slightly cynical view of, uh, of um, military actions, which was Thomas, so it was uh, Alexander Hamilton, who wrote in Federalist Number no. 6, uh, that innumerable wars originate entirely in private passions in the attachments, enmities, interests, hopes and fears of leading individuals in the communities of which they are members. And then he goes on to give a rather enlightening analysis of the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War, which he said was really caused by the, uh, and originally sparked by the uh, Athenian leader Pericles, um, basically doing a favor for his girlfriend who ran a brothel, who was at odds with a fellow brothel owner. And Pericles obligingly went and devastated the enemy brothel owner's hometown, which is not the sort of thing you find in um, sort of learned academic histories, but and it's a particularly gross example, but it does, um, it does, I think, cut to the cut to the chase of what uh, certainly our contemporary defense system is all about. Because one thing that's fairly obvious once you start to look clearly at it, it's not about defense. Um, if it were, I mean, you they would exhibit, you know, you'd think the people in charge, or you would know that the people in charge would be interested in effective weapons, weapons that work, um, cost-effective operations, cost-effective planning, uh, planning that plays some attention to the actions of the enemy. And yet in our recent conflicts, we've seen none of the above. I mean, I start in the, in the, um, in the book, I start actually with a chapter about a very, by Afghan, by the standards of the recent Afghan war, very, very minor tragedy or atrocity, but one I think that really illustrates in a very big way the what's wrong or what's been going wrong, which is a story of um, in eastern Afghanistan, uh, there was a <clears throat> two A-10 close air support planes were flying on a routine mission patrol and got directed to go and attack a Taliban outpost, which was in contact with our troops. And so they accordingly flew to the designated location. And they went and they actually looked, they were able to see the target, didn't need radars, didn't need fancy infrared, whatever. So they could see with their own eyes that what they were looking at was a Afghan farm compound with absolutely no sign of the Taliban whatsoever. There were there was a farm family simply bringing the animals in. It was, it was getting towards dusk. So they reported back. They said, actually, this is a bad target. There's nothing going on here. No sign of the Taliban. They were instructed to bomb anyway. They were told they were wrong because all the electronic, all the 
high-tech information indicated this was an enemy outpost. And they, being young men of character, refused. Then another voice breaks in on the radio conversation, which is a B-1 bomber circling miles ahead, overhead, 13,000 feet, um, who say, we're ready to bomb. Uh, they could see the target on a sort of actually a fairly muddy TV screen um, inside the crew compartment, and they were ready to carry out the orders. They couldn't see the ground. Uh, it's very hard to see anything actually out of a B-1 bomber, which was originally designed to, uh, uh, to drop nuclear, fly to Moscow at supersonic speeds and drop nuclear weapons. So they, um, the, for the last time, the controller says to the A-10 pilots, are you going to bomb? They say, no, we're not. So it's handed over to the B-1, who obligingly drops nine tons of bombs on this farmhouse, wipes out the family. And of course, there was no sign of any Taliban uh, there at any, <clears throat> no one could find any sign of them ever having been there. Um, to me, that's, you know, there's so much to learn from that. Um, first of all, that the, you know, that we were sending this completely, or not first of all, among them, the fact that we were sending this completely ineffective $300 million nuclear bomber to attack farmhouses in Afghanistan, that the this um, $300 million machine couldn't actually see what it was aiming at and didn't care, and that we had a weapon to hand that where it was perfectly designed so that the people, the operators, the pilots could see what was going, could perceive the real world in real time with their, with their own eyes. And as I explained in the chapter, that's the one that the Air Force wants to get rid of. Um, that's the one that they say, we don't need that sort of thing. You know, we can do it with all high, do it with high technology. Who needs to be able to look at the ground with their own, uh, look at the target with the, the naked eye, uh, get rid of it. And there's been a you know, battle going on for several years, many years now in Congress, um, where the Air Force regularly tries to get rid of the A-10. And <clears throat> I'm glad to say a bipartisan <laughs> faction actually fights to retain it. Um, you know, there are many more dramatic stories I tell of in the book, or they seem to me fairly dramatic, of the disregard for real defense, for really for the actual mission, what we're paying these people. Uh, well, depends how, how you can measure it. I think uh, Winslow's worked it out. Winslow Wheeler is also uh, going to be joining me in a minute. Um, worked it out well over a trillion dollars, I think, is what we spend on defense if you count everything in. But certainly the official uh, bill just passed by the Congress was $778 billion, uh, authorizing, which is even more than the Biden administration asked for. Um, that's what the, <clears throat> that's what, you know, that's what we're spending. It's our money, or well, it's our debt, actually. Um, that uh, to produce this very, in one way, very entirely incompetent ramshackle edifice, in other ways, in a very efficient operation, because it's incredibly efficient at generating money for itself, uh, for the various interested parties, the contractors, the, um, the generals, the, the generals who, when they retire, uh, and, you know, I give, I mean, I've told you one example at length. I mean, let's think about, um, uh, well, one of my favorite stories is uh, um, the, the, the saga of Fat Leonard, um, a Navy contractor in the, uh, who, he was a contractor for the Navy facilitating um, the resupply of ships when they came into port of the fleet, um, such as, you know, supply the water, uh, you know, all the things that need that a ship needs when it's been on, been at sea and <clears throat> comes into port and needs to be resupplied. Uh, Leonard, well, his real name was Leonard Francis, um, he operated in the Far East and he would, um, uh, he would, <coughs> he would get the fleet, the seventh fleet, our mighty, you know, forward defense, naval defense line against China to come to the ports where he would make the most money. How did he do that? by bribing the relevant admirals, captains, and commanders with um, cash, with very lavish dinners and parties, and a team of prostitutes who were known as the Thai SEAL team. 
And so the movements of the Seventh Fleet were to a very large degree directed by Leonard, um, not, you know, not in a way to the best way to face down China and safeguard our interests, the Far East, by, but um, where, uh, you know, who Leonard and his prostitutes were able to direct them to go. I thought that was a very salutary example of the way things really go. We can go on down the list. I mean, there's, in a way, there's a fairly risible aspect to the Leonard, Fat Leonard story, but let's think about the army helmet. The army produced a helmet, was producing helmets, for the soldiers, and this was, you know, really in the fighting in the in the recent wars, they were so necessary, um, which they'd gone to great trouble to design in a way that they favoured, um, made of Kevlar, meant to be bulletproof. But what they did was actually enhance the effects of blast on the um, on the wearers, and you know, bomb blasts were the major. Um, means of you know injuring and killing our, our soldiers and marines um this was pointed out to them they said you know this 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 is a disaster um you're actually enhancing the effects of blast on the unfortunate people um who are affected by the explosion the army paid no attention the bureaucracy um rolled ahead because they didn't really care about didn't seem to care about the uh about the um, actually welfare of, of the people on the ground. And furthermore, uh, turned out that the contractor weaving the, um, the Kevlar, it's, you know, the bulletproof material, which is it's woven threads, is how it's basically made, was skimping on the threads so they could make more money. Again, whistleblowers you know, exposed this or tried to, and they were promptly fired. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it, it, John talked about the total corruption. I begin to feel this, and the more I study this over the years, it's not an entirely new phenomenon. I mean, um, one of the sort of very chilling story I heard years ago from a, a very distinguished veteran of the uh, Korean War, he said, he pointed out to me that in the first winter of the Korean War, 50% of the American casualties were from frostbite. Not surprising, very cold in Korea, on the Korean Peninsula in winter. But what was sort of horrifying was that their boots, one of the reasons, the reason they were getting frostbite in such numbers was the army boot was grossly inadequate for protecting anyone from, uh, you know, from freezing cold. So that, so my friend told me, uh, that he would lead raids on the enemy trenches to steal boots because the communist soldiers were equipped with very well designed and very well padded uh, boots. And, um, you know, the, the, the desperate Americans needed to get them to uh, save them from frostbite. And he said, he said, I remember thinking, how, it is it, how is it that I, a soldier in the most, of the, of the richest country in the world, uh, risking my life to go and steal the boots of the soldiers of the poorest country in the world. Um, and what was actually going on was it wasn't like there wasn't any money. Of course, there was, you know, untold billions for, uh, at the service of the uh, of the US military at that time. We were at war, but the money was actually being spent on the aerospace industry, particularly to build thousands of B-47 bombers, which were meant to be deemed strategic bombers <clears throat> to go and drop nuclear weapons on Moscow. In fact, although they didn't actually have the range to do so, but people didn't seem to mind about that. <clears throat> so that's, you know, it's, whereas the boot makers didn't, weren't a powerful lobby and therefore they didn't get the, or well, didn't get the incentive to design uh, reasonable boots. So, I mean, again, that's, a, you know, another, really, as John intimated in his introduction, you know, I have, a lot of so many stories which I've tried to tell in this uh, in this book. Um, you know, it affects every service. The uh, and it affects the. You know, it's a it's a. I think it sort of feeds on itself. It, it, it it's I mean, it applies to a sort of something I think is in a wider sphere, which is that uh, the system only look looks in inward. Um, so the U.S. Navy. I mean, let me explain that as an example. The U.S. Navy, um, you know, as a carrier, it's a, built around the aircraft carriers, which are being now, you know, being sent to sort of hover off the uh, 
off the coast of uh, East Asia to you know, face down the Chinese, our new favored enemy. Um, and um, you know, notwithstanding the fact, it's patently obvious that, um, you know, the, that the aircraft carriers would be sunk in minutes of a war opening. I mean, that the, um, you know, they're extremely vulnerable to submarines, to missiles, which could be launched from not far away on the Chinese mainland. I mean, it's, this is not a matter for argument. Everyone knows this. And yet, because it suits the structure of the Navy to invest in aircraft carriers, you know, it'll remain so. Um, I remember reading of years ago that the uh, right at the beginning of the beginning of the Cold War, when the Navy was, uh, they didn't, there was a reluctance on the part of the Navy to consider the Soviet Union an enemy because the Soviet Union didn't have aircraft carriers and therefore it couldn't be a, a serious naval power. I mean, it's again, it's, you know, it's only thinking about looking inward. The, the other, I don't want to wrap it on for too long. Um, I certainly want to hear from other people in line behind me, but, uh, the most extraordinary um, thing I discovered or came across in looking at this whole system, the whole energy, is that the, is, is, what I realized it resembles in a way that the, an organic creature, a giant, I called it a virus in the relevant chapter in the book. But um, actually, first of all, I, I had an argument with an editor. I, I suggested amoeba. And he said an amoeba sounded too sort of benign. So I went, went with virus. But what I was thinking about what I was talking about was a thing discovered, a phenomenon discovered by uh, Chuck Spinney, who I hope will join the discussion at some point this evening, and uh, the late great, very great Pierre Spray, um, you know, inspiration to certainly in my thinking, dominant, you know, sort of really taught me how to think about all this stuff um, and many other people too which was that if you look at the defense budget since 1954, they've grown overall at a, at a rate of 5% a year. And, you know, the wars come and go, um, you know, tensions rise, tensions fall, but the line sticks fairly closely to that 5%. And what's really extraordinary is that every time the look, it dips below 5%, it seems to be sort of deviating from the norm, along comes a crisis. Uh, for example, um, well, at the end of the uh, end of the Eisenhower era, Eisenhower was um, actually who understood the system very well was actually seeking to cut defense spending was cutting defense spending because he wanted to spend on other things. Along came the missile gap. Um, the Vietnam War ends uh, in 1975. Suddenly, we hear a lot more about the um, the Soviet Union turned out to be a lot more menacing than previously advertised, and there was a civil defense gap and a, a missile accuracy gap and all the rest. But it's like the system, if you think of it in organic terms, it's like it's a creature that exists to safeguard its own food supply and grow. So I always felt it was like an automatic reaction. Um, you know, the, the budget, the budget's in peril, uh, you know, the food supply's in peril, and therefore generates a defensive mechanism, which is a bit of threat inflation or a huge amount of threat inflation. Um, and that really, how else can we explain the fact that, for example, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, the defense budget, it's true, did go down uh, for a number of years and they did, but it, it corrected uh, by 1997, 98, it was growing again um, because we had a new threat. First of all, we had, you know, the, maybe more, as soon after we had, even before the terrorist threat, the war on terror, kicked off, we had, you know, we were hearing about China as a, a near a near peer competitor, or potentially a peer competitor. And now the now the um, you know the the, the anti-terrorist wars have wound down in defeat. I'm sorry, to, not too surprisingly, but I'm sorry to <coughs> have to have to announce. We're hearing a lot, you know, we've got a new Cold War with Russia and China. Um, the system and the defense budget is you know, is sticking very, is 
corrected itself into that 5% pathway and is carrying on. So what we, you know, I think what I say to people when I, you know, give talks and give interviews and so forth is that what they say, what, you know, what, what should people take away? What they should take away is they're being had, they're being promised, you know, a magnificent defense system. And you think at least, you know, there are complaints from progressives that, uh, or others, you know, many people that, you know, gosh, we're spending too much money on defense and we need it for education and health. And that's all true, but there's an assumption that goes with it that at least we're getting seven, eight hundred billion dollars worth of defense out of it. And of course, we're not. We're getting, not only we're we not getting a, an adequate defense out of it, uh, we're getting, um, we're getting, you know, so it has a negative effect. The more money you cram in, the more, you know, it promotes greed, it promotes corruption, the less interest there is in, uh, in, um, in, in, you know, in, in doing the job, doing the job as, uh, as, as advertised, um, and, you know, what people think they're paying for. And the whole, you know, we, we this is the Empire Salon. I mean, I, I people say, you know, a, I have arguments with people who say, well, you know, they, there's militarism, you know, therefore generates the defense budget. I say the defense budget generates militarism, generates the wars. Um, why, you know, that, that we, I mean, there's a chilly, there's a story which I still find very shocking to think about it, that I heard when Trump was prevailed on to have a sort of minor surge in Afghanistan. And someone I know was, was a relatively junior officer, but had a staff position and was um, uh, sitting along the back row of a meeting of very senior Marine generals, basically the, all the Marine four, four stars. And they were talking about, you know, Trump's the initiative and they were going to, and they were saying, well, they're all agreeing. They were laughing. He said, they said, well, this won't do us any, you know, this won't make any difference to the war. Um, but we are certainly going along with it because it'll do us good at budget time. And he was, you know, <laughs> horrified. He's a very moral officer. And he thought, people are going to get killed. Uh, and yet all these jokers can talk about is, you know, what it's going to do for them at budget time. And I think, you know, it's a simple consideration, but it's something people really have to internalize that this is a gigantic and crooked ripoff. So with that, I have <clears throat> maybe talked too, too long, but um, let me, uh, John, I'll let, 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 turn, turn it Great. back. We'll, we'll open it up. Uh, Winslow, why don't you um, jump in here? You've <clears throat> spent your whole career and you've been on the Hill uh, watching the defense budget. Um, um, how, how do you convey to people who really haven't spent the time that you and Andrew have uh, how utterly corrupt this system is to the core? It's, it's very hard to communicate to people who haven't made the investment uh, and time and, and resources that you guys have. Well, you can start out by saying it's never been worse. Um, and by it, uh, I think one of the most important things is oversight, uh, which is an attempt to keep the system honest. And currently it's never been worse. It, I want to say first, thank you to John Henry for the opportunity to talk along with Andrew's comments. And I want to make note of the remarkable family that Andrew comes from and has uh, three remarkable brothers who made gigantic contributions to what we understand about the world uh, and his wife. Uh, uh, all four of them are actually specialists in oversight by telling us what the hell is going on and helping us understand it at something beyond this, you know, increasingly superficial level that the mainstream me media feeds to us. Um, the problem with oversight is that it's now dead. Uh, and to uh, make that real, I want to do a little experiment and um, read out four names. Uh, those four names are Sean O'Donnell, 
Susanna Bloom, Michael McCord, and Nicholas Gerton. Um, big prizes to anybody who knows who a single one of those people are, let alone more than one. They're the four most important people in today's Defense Department for performing oversight. Uh, Sean O'Donnell is the current Department of Defense Inspector General. He's acting. He was actually appointed by Trump. Um, he was previously the EPA Inspector General, and he was given the DOD job because Trump got rid of the sitting uh, Department of Defense Inspector General because he was going to chair an oversight panel on the first COVID bailout uh, uh, funds. They didn't want the oversight, so they got rid of him. And that's, that uh, spiked the entire panel for this oversight. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, O'Connell seemed to have no problem with taking the position and playing a role in spiking that. Um, so, and he's, he's right now uh, Joe Biden's uh, Inspector General for the Department of Defense. They've appointed somebody new, but uh, he hasn't made it through the Senate yet. Um, Susanna Bloom is the head of the Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation Office in the Defense Department, which is key for understanding and Accurate, uh, trying to accurately predict what the cost of weapon systems and programs is going to be. Um, and for evaluating weapon systems and uh, reporting uh, to the secretary as if uh, they were the in-house think tank. Her background is, uh, she's, uh, uh, she was at the Center for a New American Strategy. She was, specialized there, according to her bio, on defense strategy and plans. In the Obama administration, she served in the office of the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Plans and Posture. What the heck this has to do with accurate cost assessment and figuring out uh, what weapons work and what don't, um, that's beyond me. Um, one of the first things that Kate did under her control was to eliminate all the uh, key reports on weapon system costs called the selected acquisition reports. Uh, these are annual reports on the Defense Department's own best guess uh, led by Kate as to what the costs are gonna be. And for, uh, the past fiscal year, they decided, oh, we don't need those, let's get rid of them. And by the way, they're planning to get rid of them permanently and replace them with God knows what. Um, Michael McCord is the controller. Um, he is the chief financial officer of the Department of Defense. Um, his background is to be with industry and before that, um, he was Obama's um, controller. And um, before that, he was the budget guy at the Senate Armed Services Committee, where I, I knew him from a distance. Um, uh, back then, the Senate Armed Services Committee busied itself with trying to violate or circumvent budget rules rather than observe them. Um, and for the past um, uh, decade or so, we know how well um, the Defense Department's done on getting itself audited. Um, we can get into the ugly details of that, but it's been a pathetic failure, even uh, despite the small progress they claim they've made. Finally, Nichols Gurton is the Director of Operational Tests and Evaluation. He was appointed by Biden and has been confirmed by the Senate. Um, um, the, uh, the next operational test he oversees uh, will be the first one. Um, uh, he distinguished himself by um, being uh, part of an effort to classify um, the annual report 
that the director of operational test and evaluation has been making uh, by law for the last uh, 40 years. Um, um, that was awesome. And um, uh, there's not a distinguished reason, there's not a reason why he should get the job and I'm not at all optimistic that he's gonna perform the job anything like um, uh, some of the pre predecessors. It's been up and down quality in that, in that job. Uh, but uh, he's not gonna be one of the better ones. It, it shows every sign of that. Uh, a second uh, locus of oversight, as we all know, is the defense press. Um, it's gotten worse and worse. Um, uh, Ray McGovern, a uh, uh, former CAA guy that some of us read, uh, describes the current defense press as transcribers. Uh, I think that's quite accurate. Most of them uh, merely write down what they see in press releases or write down what they get from their trusted sources. Don't check it don't balance it with the other side of the, of the story. Um, and it's just a transcribing operation. There are, of course, exceptions to that. Uh, Andrew is, of course, one of them. There are a very few others. Uh, Tony Capasio at Bloom, Bloomberg News comes to mind. Um, uh, every now and then, we see something worthwhile um, uh, from some others. But the quality of defense journalism is is in the crapper. Um, finally, this Congress um, that's supposed to be the bottom line of what uh, oversight uh, achieves. Um, tune in to any hearing of the Senate or House Armed Services Committee, or uh, if you want to dig deeper, the House or Senate Defense Appropriations Committee. What you will see is a string of speeches. Um, sometimes they tag on at the end of their little speech, and what do you think of that? Um, sometimes you'll see them reading from a document, um, uh, and that's a staff memo. They're reading off the question. They get a nothing answer. They read off the next question rather than follow up on the baloney answer they got from the first question. It goes on and on. Um, um, in the 1980s, this matrix of oversight worked okay. It didn't work great, but it worked okay. There was a series of connections between individuals in those four offices I described in the Pentagon and some staff on Capitol Hill and some reporters. Um, it was a, a hit and miss system, but almost every week it would result in something showing up in the press or in a congressional hearing um, or a meeting of the Military Reform Caucus on Capitol Hill that the Pentagon really didn't want you to know about. Um, and there'd be a panic inside the building uh, and the major objective would be to find what son of a bitch leaked that information to Dina Razor or uh, the Military Reform Caucus or Chuck Grassley or on rare occasions, a member of the Senate or House Armed Services Committee. Um, but there was a constant diet of, of these pieces of information that were valuable. Um, it was based on whistleblower type information. Um, facts, reports, um, um, uh, data. That network is alive today. There's links between these you know, people in the Pentagon, people on the Hill, people in the press, but the commodity they're trading in is not whistleblower kinds of information or data or reports, it's um, um, uh, Judith Miller kinds of journalism. Well, and we, we remember who she was. She was talking to Dick Cheney about uh, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq before the second war there. 
And her information was good information because it came from a high source. Um, that's the quality control we have today in so much of what we're reading. Um, it's not what the content is, it's, it's policy advocacy, it's program advocacy, um, it's not journalism, it's not oversight, it's advocacy. Um, um, it's, it's as if we had a system basically where um, the students are grading their own exams. Um, it's not just that the students are grading their own exams, they're writing their own exams, they're taking their own exams, and then they grade them. It's a it's circular information. It has nothing to do with oversight. Um, and I'll stop there on the cheery note that uh, oversight in our system of government on the Pentagon is, is dead. Well, Winslow, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, we, we've got uh, five, I, I count five former uh, salon speakers and uh, uh, see we have uh, Katrina Van Hoovel here. Uh, Russia's uh, Katrina's in the news. Uh, um, would you jump in here? You're on mute. Uh, you're you're mute. You have to unmute yourself. Did, Katrina, did I, it's, did I get in trouble? No, I was in the news. No, we just uh, couldn't hear you. Um, no, I was. Just, I. It's been an extraordinarily interesting conversation. I. I, I wanted to ask Andrew what he makes, um, I'm so struck, and often it's an excuse, but the idea of the weapon system as the indestructible, you know, put it in every backyard of a representative and it's indestructible. The idea that military Keynesianism defined the post-World War II economic development of this country. So you have, you know, these people who are not doing what they should do in communities around this country, but bringing Northrop in. Um, I don't, but I was struck by Wendell, Sorry, Winslow, Miller. what you said about oversight, you could have learned and the Times did very late by just taking, what was it, Sigur, the oversight in Afghanistan, and they pulled together all the inspector general reports. But no one really does that enough today. There is a total distrust of oversight, as you said. It's, it's dead. But the question is, you say it worked in the 1980s. What would work today? Would it have to be less advocacy journalism, a trust in the oversight committees, uh, sources? Um, um, I'm sure the one additional note about what happened to him is they kept on classifying more and more information in his reports so that what he did report and it was highly weak. valuable was less and less. Um, um, in a broken system like that, I, I see the problems as moral and going to the people who are performing these functions. Um, uh, how do you improve morals? I don't know, but there is a way to improve politicians' behavior. Okay. Um, the way we I found to try to do it as a staffer was to try to point out to the politician that there's um, great politics to be made by performing this oversight stuff. Um, uh, one example was my second boss, uh, Nancy Kassebaum from Kansas, a Republican. Um, the problem was the B-1 bomber and her problem was that Boeing and Wichita had a billion dollars of avionics right. work. And um, I had a you know ongoing dialogue over a couple of months with her about that piece of equipment based on information I was getting from um, people inside the Pentagon and some reporting that was being done on it. And she, it came to her that, that maybe this really isn't something she wanted to be associated with. And uh, she came out against it. Um, um, Boeing got all kinds of upset, um, but she reminded them that she was chairman of the Civil Asia Aviation Subcommittee and the Commerce Committee. And if Boeing wanted to give her a bunch of crap, 
she could okay. easily return the favor. Um, but more importantly, and the key point was that she got lots of positive feedback on uh, opposing Kansas pork in the Kansas newspapers. Interesting. Um, I have in my files over here, Wichita Beacon, uh, Topeka, Topeka Eagle Beacon story about good for her for being even minded and thinking about the nation rather than herself and okay. Kansas and being somebody whose sentiments on that you could rely on. I had similar experiences both with um, uh, two, three of my four Senate bosses, Jacob Javits opposed an ABM system. Bill Javits. Javits, I worked for him for 10 years uh, in Syracuse and David Pryor, the father of the other Senator, Mark Pryor, um, opposed the big eye bomber that was fabricated in Arkansas. And the three of them all got all kinds of positive feedback by doing this. Yeah. Uh, similarly, senators that get serious about oversight inform themselves before a hearing and do a good job um, asking um, simple but informed questions mm -hmm. and not taking crap for an answer uh, from the Pentagon witness, get a reputation for being somebody you don't want to screw around with, but also start getting the attention of the press as somebody to go to, to ask about this, that, or the other thing um, on defense matters. Um, it's positive political feedback for doing feedback, the that's thing. It's, it's a simple concept, but today we're miles and miles from that. I point. hope I might be in touch with you just to remind some of today's Congress people, whether they even know these names, I suspect they do, of what a positive feedback loop looks like with these very transpartisan people. And uh, I do think the press is a big issue, but that's, a, that's for Andrew. Uh, we had William Grider for many years, who was wonderful. Right. You know, he really knew how to report and do the defense. And it's, to me, the fact that there's a cut the defense budget in Congress is okay, but it should be reform the military. It should be bigger than that. Anyway, I hope to reach out to you. Thank you. Sure, happy to do it. So if I could just add, uh, William Proxmire, uh, he disclosed, among other abuses, yeah. this Monday, that was Ernie Fitzgerald, reported that to him. He won re-election spending a couple hundred dollars, the filing fee. Uh, Absolutely. He didn't make any money whatsoever. But I think there's, uh, let me offer just an additional supplement to your observations. Uh, I've worked um, with Ralph Nader to try to refund the Office of Technology Assessment. So you would actually have some intellectual infrastructure in Congress to try to assess the technological capabilities of many of the weapon systems, but other spending elements as well. They just don't want to do it. I think from the time you were there, the power has migrated all to the leadership. When Newt Gingrich came in, he defunded or slashed the funding, committees, the staff, and everything. Uh, and it's never been restored. So mm -hmm. now the committees themselves, the chairman, the subcommittees, they have vastly less power and, and staff with any brains because they don't pay them anything. So everybody leaves after a few years. There's no institutional memory anymore. And unless there's some devolution from the top down, it seems very difficult to recreate serious congressional oversight. What do you think about that? Um, uh, it's worth a try. Um, I worked for nine years at GAO. And my experience there was that um, some GR reports were really excellent, some were really awful, and most of them were really mediocre. Um, it had everything to do with the quality of the people doing the work, whether they were trained on how to investigate, how to evaluate, not just audit, audit you know, financial audits. Um, I had some experience of OTA in Kassebaum's office, and it wasn't all that great. Um, OTA had a great reputation, which in my judgment, they didn't deserve. Um, it's all in the staff that you get there. The, the way I think to start going down that road is to make sure that people in hi are hired and fired only by joint agreement of the Republican and Democrat 
who have the oversight of you know that agency, whether it's CBO or GAO or congressional staff, especially congressional staff on committees should be hired and fired by joint decisions by the uh, a minority and the majority, not just be these you know political gophers um, uh, for the chairman. Um, um, but you got to pay a lot of attention um, to the quality of the output of an agency like OTA, and I'd be all for um, um, asking GAO to check over the quality of OTA reports and vice versa. Um, you got to have people standing behind the shoulders of these people. Uh, I don't care what the outcome is. I do care about the quality of the methodology and um, uh, how they got to where they got to. And just creating an agency isn't going to do it. Um, you've got to pay, to pay a lot of attention to make sure that agency is producing the way you want it to. You know, the uh, Harry Truman one, I see right? that we... could I just uh, ask Winslow another question? I apologize for following sure. up here, but Harry Truman, you know, he ran all these defense oversight hearings before he was vice president during World War II and he got great kudos. Is that a model that's feasible to reproduce today? Absolutely. The key to it was Truman. Uh, I did a lot of reading on the Truman Commission and um, he got, he tried to visit some defense agencies driving himself there in quote his own old dodge and looked around and was horrified tried to get the white house to get interested in this uh they told him to go away and he created his own special um uh, uh special committee um he had an aggressiveness to um peel the onion and some of his press releases about the quality of American, not just the quality of American armor plate, but whether American fighter aircraft were competitive or not with German and Japanese airplanes. Um, he went all over the place. And he had a wonderful spirit of trying to peel the onion. Um, uh, he was a much better senator than he was a president. Um, um, people tried to imitate him. Most uh, Lyndon Johnson tried to imitate him. It was a big phony operation. Uh, again, you got to pay attention to what they're doing and how they're doing it. Good. Um, I see we've got a, a, a six salon speaker here, a, a, a former speaker, uh, John Mueller or uh, Derek LeBert or our board member, Molly McCartney. Do you want to jump in here? Uh, let me uh, ask a question for Andrew. Uh, the the uh, ultimate problem in many respects uh, seems to me that something that hasn't been re reported on, which is the American people. Uh, the American military has had 20 years of abject failure in uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and in Libya. Uh, still, the American people rate the, uh, the, the trust the military more than any place else. If a politician tries to go against that, he's going to get clobbered. If the press that goes against it, they're not, people aren't going to read it. Uh, and so ultimately, the question is, how, after 20 years of abject failure, why does the American public still regard the military so, um, so highly? Well, it's true, and <laughs> it's a good point. I mean, it, it points to the, you know, one thing that the American military is extremely good at, which is uh, self-promotion. Um, I mean, you yeah, had, but it works. You had some brilliant people. Everybody, everybody, every, everybody tries to promote themselves. The military promotes themselves and it, it sells. Yeah, they're very, well, they're very good. I mean, there's was, there was some, been some particularly brilliant strokes, um, uh, like the embedding. I mean, what a, I forget her name now, who was um, Rumsfeld's public, uh, public affairs person. Victoria Clark, I think her name was, uh, and she kept. She said, "When the, you know, the sight of young crew cut, you know, polite young men, yeah. American soldiers, you know, if, if um, you know, if we put the journalists next to them, the journalists won't be able to resist, and they'll, 
you know, they'll give them great play. Why well, so it happened? I mean, I think it was a really terrible, a terrible development, the whole embedding system that was deployed uh, for the uh, for the second Iraq war. Um, you know, they, it's been a very slick thing. I think, how do we counteract that? I think it's, um, you know, it has to start with the, you know, with the press, with the, with the willingness of the media uh, to actually, you know, do their job. Um, you know, it's it's. But, they, but, but their job is to get clicks. Well, yes, you're right. Um, that unfortunately, they, not not to convey news. I mean, I agree. It's a depressing and uphill uphill struggle. I mean, part part of the problem is the the military is sort of, you know, it's largely in, invisible in a way. We don't, you know, you don't see even in in Washington D.C. You very rarely see people in uniform on the streets. Um, you know, there are military sit towns and cities around the country. You know, like. Ladine, Texas, and, and um, if, you're on, if you're on your way to Dullis up Route 28, you, know, you if you look at the office buildings, they're all defense buildings and defense offices. But um, I think, you know, it's because the military has become so divorced from society in one way, um, and it only exists really, you know, as commercials. I mean, people, you know, the exciting films of, um, of, uh, you know, fighter planes and so forth, which the military will hand out to media. Um, there has to be a way to bring home the reality um, in some way. And I would start with, you know, I think we just have to try and get editors and TV producers to do their job. I agree that won't solve it, but it'd be the beginning. Can I, can I Same uh, have, Pat. jump in with this okay. a little bit? Um, the sure. internet has done incredible things to ruin journalism. Um, my, my impression is that most of these guys would like to do, or, and women, would like to do a better job, but they're under such intense pressure to get their article out, you know, an hour after, you know, they're assigned to go write it. Um, uh, when you're rushed like that, you can't, you, you can't, you can't skin the onion um, and you just, uh, transcribing what you're told by this source who's going to cooperate with you by feeding you all the baloney uh, you can digest. Um, and, and that's a, that's a creation of the internet. Let me add, if I could respond as well, I think the problem may be deeper than that. I think the species in general, not unique to the United States, it celebrates the armored knight and say moves across the pages of romance and poetry. We have the statutes, the monuments, the memorials. It's all military. You go to the, the, the football or the baseball game and they bring out the military. They're saluted and no one objects to that. You stand up at the seventh inning stretch. It's always the military. And it's ingrained into the culture, into the system. Our heroes are military heroes. Uh, we have 400 uh, uh, celebrations and, and monuments to military and none of philosophers. It's unfortunate, but that's built into the species. We always honor those who are very proficient at killing other people in the name of empire, conquest, or whatever you have. And I don't know how you change that, because I don't think it's unique to the United States. Bruce. Uh, all countries celebrate the warrior. The memorials are being changed in different ways because there is an attention to the Confederates, which form many of the memorials. And there is a discussion as a result of that about the military. But I was going to say on the staff, the staff in Congress today is very cautious, more cautious than the representatives. There's no history. There's no memory. I mean, it's Vietnam and you get clouded eyes. You know, I'm just saying there has to be a restoration of history in order to give maybe some spine to people because there is no sense that it's in their own tradition that there's oversight, there's war powers, there's beginning. But just so people would know that there, there's, it's partly the internet, it's partly our school, it's partly the way we live today, it's in every country. But I think we need to bring history back and this, kind, this history is not being taught in schools. Um, and I think that is where there's an important. But part of the reason, Katrina, is that Congress pays their staffers, you know, $60,000 a year on Capitol Hill. I'm in the middle of it, these people, you're not going to get quality people. And, 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 and Winslow was absolutely right. It, the people count. And $60,000 a year is not going to get there people who know the Vietnam War. 
<laughs> there are a few who cause instigate change and who are at the forefront and it's it's good and you support them but it's it's the general tenor of just i mean we've been fighting my father had in his files a Powell memo not to get into that but we also had where ralph was featured as the grave danger to the system and we've you know just kind of there's a memory hole which i see at the nation among interns so i just kind of despair but i i also i would say one word for the american people i think there is a disconnect between the establishment in washington and people maybe well, they respect the military because it's also a career step in colin powell and but i don't think people want to be deployed in, in multiple ways in 60 counties in 2020 sorry 2016 in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin went for Trump because of multiple deployments, and he spoke well about ending endless war. Did yep. he act? Uh, but you know, I'm not sure people are up for more war. John, context related. Pat, you want? Yeah, let me. Uh, Pat, I, I, Pat, I, Pat Moy. Yeah, my former boss, uh, Senator William Proxmire. I was, I worked for him. I was general counsel of the Senate Banking Committee when Proxmire, Senator Proxmire, was chairman. Um, he left, you know, that's a long time ago now. He left the Congress in, in, in January 1989. So that's a long time ago. Here's what I see. American people don't want to be all in, in these endless wars. Uh, Katrina put her finger right on it. But what's going on that I see is the money in the political system now. As much, I, I worked up there 15 years. Now these guys have to spend so much time raising money True. and from the people who have it and these big companies have it. Now staff who don't get paid a lot, we used to call people who left the hill to go work in a lobbying firm selling out. Now they call it cashing in. <laughs> so you've got, you've got to deal with the problem of money in the political system, the Supreme Court made a mistake in saying money was speech. I mean, the Congress tried to protect itself, and then the Supreme Court overruled their own law. So you, 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 you can't. And then the other thing I see going on, all these people who are former generals are now on all these talk shows talking about and trying to convince the American people that getting out of Afghanistan was a terrible mistake. And now that we have to stand up to the Russians in the Ukraine uh, for, for some reason or another, I mean, and these are former military guys, generals, there ought to be a law to prevent that from happening. Um, so these are the kinds of things, I think you gotta get into the money in the political system, or you're not gonna, you're not gonna cure what's really killing this country. I think that's a really important point. Um, um, it require, it's going to require a constitutional amendment, good luck, to seriously get money uh, away from the politicians. You, you could do it through a different Supreme Court decision. You don't have to use a constitutional amendment. Yeah, with, with the current makeup, Pat, that's, yeah. uh, that's a total, complete uh, illusion. And you wrote a great piece about, about this. This is going to do that. Yeah. But Patrick, it's not simply on TV. The Washington Post reported, I have to say it reported, but it didn't make an impact that the many of the generals were on the mill were on Northrop and Grunt, you know, they were in the on the boards of the very company. Of the companies. Yeah. I mean, it was a good reporting piece. There's some good reporting, factual, but it doesn't, you know, it's like outrageous. Well, let's let, uh, let me jump in. It, it, it doesn't sell what it doesn't do. I mean, Washington Whitlock, Whitlock's thing was sensational on, on Afghanistan, and it basically bombed. No one wanted to hear about it. No one was clicking on it. So the Andrew, problem it's all you people showing me, they, they, they're trying, and when they do it, no one pays any attention. They're paying attention to the people who pay them, namely the people who click, and the people who buy their papers. Let me, let me can I jump in and say something? <clears throat> which applies not just to you know what we're talking about defense but to, to the wider sphere which is um an organization i'm, I'm connected to um, the project on government oversight which does tremendous work i mean it's um 
on the fence. I mean, it's 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 uh, the, the Dan Grazier, Mandy Smithberger there, and the rest of the team are tremendous reporters. And actually, a lot of what we <clears throat> the real truths that come out come from them. But they Pogo recently or a couple of months ago commissioned a poll in I think Ohio and Michigan. I think it was in just those states on what was what people were concerned about. You know, what political issue. They were really worried about um, the economy, you know, climate change, whatever. By a very, very wide margin, the number one issue was corruption. Wow. People were, I think it was 87%. I mean, just corruption was it. And yeah. specifically because this was a POGO initiative, they were asked, you know, what sort of examples of corruption and very, very high on the list was where the, um, the revolving door. Uh, yeah all the generals and admirals and uh, whatnot, you know, <clears throat> barely waiting, waiting for the minute of their retirement so they could scarper off to be on the board of Northrop and Lockheed or whatever. I mean, Pogo did actually a great investigation, which the Washington Post used uh, they were on how many, I think it was uh, 350. I think it was, it was the majority, it was over 80% of all the three and four star generals and admirals who'd retired in recent years had gone to in the, to the service of major defense corporations. But mm -hmm. the thing of people, yes, people, you know, we've been talking about people do sort of glorify the military and, um, you know, as part of a very sustained, as a result of a very sustained and slick promotional job, hugely funded, uh, it's got, that's gone on for years and years. But people also, as has been mentioned already, you know, they, they hate these wars. They can see how pointless they were. Uh, they know, you know, people know people who've been come back maimed and, uh, had their lives destroyed. So, and people are aware and resent the corruption. And, you know, it's not an original thought to say that helped get Trump elected, not just his denunciation of foreign wars. I mean, he, mendacious as that was, but also his other remarks about, yeah. about corruption. So I think, uh, you know, that the, pol the politicians are so particularly, and both by particularly, and, you know, the Democrats are so scared to sort of touch this. I mean, you have Nancy Pelosi defending stock trading by uh, members of Congress in the week that we hear that the deputy chairman of the Federal Reserve has been making a few bucks. Uh, uh, I mean, people, this is a, a huge latent issue. Uh, people are not stupid. Picked up, picked up on. I agree. So uh, Jeff uh, Steinberg, I see you're down in uh, Florida. Uh, we've got snow up here. Um, can you bring some sunshine to bear oh. here? Love to. Thank you. Uh, question for Andrew. Um, based on the framework that you've presented tonight and in your book, uh, it strikes me that the biggest financial and most dangerous financial scam of the post-Cold War period was NATO expansion, which of course mandates interoperable military hardware, which keeps the US and European defense industries coming along and happy. Most of the countries uh, really don't have the capacity to use that stuff and creeping closer to the Russian border. Uh, this obviously in light of current events has the potential to blow completely out of control into a major war. But I can definitely see that one of the drivers was the idea of perpetuating and expanding the base of mandatory uh, military uh, purchases. But well, yeah, I'm glad you... I'm glad, I'm glad you bring that up. Actually, I do have a chapter in the book about um, about NATO expansion, about the new Cold War, and very much a, a moving spirit in in the whole operation. Uh, well, first of all, there was Norm Augustine, who was the uh, very um, adroit and extremely gifted in the business sense um, uh, head of Lockheed or, or Martin Marietta, which essentially took over Lockheed and. The firm was known as Lockheed, and then there was a huge push right on the heels or even ahead of the diplomats uh, expanding nature to sell F-16s. I mean, there was, um, remember, you know, the Cold War had ended, they were in, they could see a problem coming. I mean, the, mark, the reason for their existence was going away. And so there was a big push to sell F-16s in, in Europe, which um, by Lockheed, which was very, you know, I mean, people who were there in the European, Eastern European capitals at the time uh, remarked on, you know, they, they got very squalid. There was a case, it wasn't Lockheed, it was another, 
actually maybe a uh, Bell helicopter was go going to sell, uh, persuade the Romanians to enter into a joint venture to, to build the Dracula helicopter. And um, a, a major salesman for um, in this effort was Rick Burt, a former uh, national security correspondent for the New York Times and ambassador and so forth. And this was at a time when the Romanian hospital, the, the, the Roman, Romania was in a state of collapse. The Romanian hospitals in Bucharest had no running water. And yet these, uh, these terrible parasites were doing this. There was also the, um, the committee to expand NATO, um, headed by uh, Bruce Jackson, who was, uh, you know, coincidentally, a vice president of Lockheed. And he, he'll assure, assure you and assure anyone who asks that his vice presidency of Lockheed had nothing to do with his efforts to expand NATO, which were extremely effective, as we know. So, yeah, you're absolutely right that, you know, I, there was, well, again, Pierre Spray, um, uh, he once used to say that uh, the US government has two principal functions, to buy arms at home and sell arms abroad. And that's how I view NATO expansion. Um, uh, I see we have uh, some of my uh, Harvard classmates, um, uh, Larry DeCara and uh, Ted Boris. Uh, Ted, uh, you wrote, I've got on my shelf your book on the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, do you want to jump in here? I see you're on mute. You got to unmute yourself. Got to unmute on the left bottom. Uh, okay. I, I thanks. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Uh, and I, I, I hate to jump into this distinguished panel, but I, I, I think we're missing some important dynamics here, or at least we're not talking about them. Uh, aren't there many historians who comment that one of uh, America's problems is that after every war, they immediately try to stand the military down and shift all of that saved money to major domestic priorities, Never seen. only to find several years later that they've got to scramble to catch back up. And in doing so, that's like hugely expensive. And a, a second one that I think of is the perspective of the, let's call it the working level military, the, the guys and women increasingly who have to go out there and fight and, uh, and die. They want the best damn weapons that can possibly be created by mankind so that fewer of them will die and more of the enemy will be killed first. And I have this great quote from Lieutenant General Hodges, who was in charge of the military in, in Europe until recently. And he said, quote, we're not interested in a fair fight against anyone. We want to have overmatch in all areas, unquote. So, uh, you know, you just can't brush aside the desire of the military establishment to be able to win whatever conflicts they're order to go off into. Well, we solved the problem of standing down after wars. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> what um, happened to the peace gap or the peace? Peace dividend. Peace dividend, sorry. Yeah, it doesn't exist. And moreover, with regard to um, this idea that they're out there just needing to get uh, the best over all of their opponents, uh, it's a, maybe not directly on point, but you may have read the New York Times Magazine article on examining uh, the, uh, the results of many of these uh, drone warfare campaigns where the Defense Department would always say, oh, our electronic intelligence showed this was um, military uh, weapons uh, facility or these were Taliban or whatever. And in one instance, and there were many, uh, it was shown that their electronic surveillance identified three kids on a roof. Uh, they were there because they needed heat since the heating system doesn't work in the home. Uh, and uh, the defense of exterminating the kids was, well, uh, we knew the kids were there, but we decided uh, based upon the rule of proportionality, uh, killing the three kids was worth the possibility, and I underscore the possibility that maybe this was a roof of a weapons facility, uh, even though there was nothing imminent happening. 
Um, so I think that the military has real problems with regard to having any kind of ethical, moral standards when it comes to conducting warfare. There are no war crimes prosecutions. Uh, it's, well, we don't need that because we can just walk away since we're the only superpower in the world. And I think that demoralizes at least what ought to be a high level of esprit in the military and why we are not welcomed as angels when we go abroad. Huh. At New York Times uh, 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 study um, on drones is a great piece of work which by the way, was not written by uh, the standard New York Times correspondence. And it also came about 10 years after Andrew's book on exactly the same problem. Yeah. Um, the, the problem is, uh, doesn't work as advertised. To get these things to work and to uh, satisfy the sometimes desired a uh, desire of the military that they actually work well. Uh, you need to go through a kind of process that keeps on checking itself to see if um, uh, we're going down the right path. You start that with competitive prototypes based on requirements, not from the um, uh, people at Lockheed Martin or the scientists at DARPA, but from the field. Um, you compete prototypes, you pick the one that actually wins, which is a novel concept for some Defense Department selections. Um, um, you get a, uh, a decent cost estimate uh, that's been checked by outsiders. Um, you compete the production proce uh, process. Uh, uh, these are the kinds of things that our current system hates uh, and will go to great lengths to avoid and throw up phony excuses like, oh, we're in a big hurry, therefore we need to obviate this you know, bothersome testing or these time consuming competitions. Uh, a great example of what you get in your lap uh, because of the, the crap process they advocate is the F-35, the littoral combat ship, the new Ford class aircraft carrier, um, the new marine amphibious tank that they've been working on for about 20 years and they keep on not working and so on and so on and so on. Uh, they detest a process that results in good equipment. Let's see, we have also uh, Molly uh, uh, McCartney, uh, Molly, so on our board, Molly wrote the uh, America's War Machine. She thought that was a better title than Military Industrial Complex because <laughs> it could be understood more easily. Uh, Molly, you there? Yeah, I'm here. I was just trying to unmute. Uh, it's a great discussion. Many good points have been made, but I'm reminded of what we heard in the program on who killed Lieutenant Van Dorn of the ongoing right. problem of the military producing these weapons and then not bothering to maintain them. Uh, even the ones that work well, they don't maintain. Uh, there's an absence of the actual uh, equipment uh, pieces, the, the screws and bolts needed to maintain these, in, in the case of Lieutenant Van Dorn, a particular helicopter. Uh, and that that issue has not really had the kind of exposure that some of these other issues have, uh, but I'd be interested in what our speaker has to say about that as an overall piece of the problem. Uh, how big a piece do you think the failure to maintain weapons that even work when they're brought out onto the battlefield, uh, but uh, over time fail to uh, continue to perform well because of the absence of maintenance. What we were told in the program by the people who seem to know something about it was that the money that normally would have gone to maintenance was instead being diverted to buy fancy new bells and whistles for new kinds of weapons. Um, so I'd like to hear an elaboration on those two points, if I could. Well, I mean, that that last remark, you may quote from, the, from that film, um, 
is exactly it. You know, that the money, um, because the object of the exercise is money, um, therefore, you know, the, what gets cut and what gets skimped on is um, operations and maintenance. Um, you know, who you know, spare parts and proper maintenance is not you know, huge, as huge a money spinner as, you know, the, some um, fancy fighter of the F-35 or whatever. So they, um, so, so they always skimp and it's, and it's one of the re, I mean, that's a, it's a, it's part of a, not a larger cycle, which is they take the money, they want to spend the money um, and therefore they spend it, you know, they deliberately conceive and design and procure vastly complex systems, which are very, you know, delicate um, break down all the time, um, but they haven't funded the maintenance properly. So they break down, you know, they have even more of them are, uh, are out of operation. So therefore they demand more money because they say we need, you know, more money to buy more planes or whatever it might be, because, you know, we, we're, we're so short of, uh, short of the number, which um, cause so many of them are out of, out of operation all the time. So again, it's, you know, it's a wonderfully efficient way of generating revenue and profits. It's not a very efficient way of, um, of uh, and it's disastrous. You're quite right to point out that, how important this is um, that we, you know, we have a force that, I mean, I think the, Windsor can probably correct me here, but I think the F-35, F-35 C, the Navy carrier version of the F-35, I think we've had something like a, a seven percent capability, you know, re operational readiness rate. I don't know, Winslow, you could you know better. Than uh, that. Fully mission capable rate in the single digits. Yes, um, uh, it may be a smidget higher, uh, maybe in the lower double digits, but it's a it's a real um, uh, uh, problem. Um, the way they try to game this one is they have two rates: uh, mission capable which means if you have five missions um, uh, assigned to your you know, mission types assigned, if you can perform one of those five, you're mission capable. Um, fully mission capable means you can perform everything you're designed to do. They love the mission capable rate measure because it's much higher, obviously. They, uh, you'll have to pull teeth to get the full, fully mission capable rate out of them. I could just make the observation. This is, it seems um, what we're talking about tonight, although it wasn't as well elegantly stated, you go back to War is a Racket, you know, published in 1935 by Smedley Butler. He describes basically all the dynamics that we've surveyed here today. Uh, you had the Nye Commission or the Nye Oversight Committee at that time. Uh, the, the munitions makers and the bankers, you know, fueled the war, the desire for it. We went from 1 billion in debt to 25 to 30 billion in debt during the war years. You know, like I, such a high percentage increase, it's almost unimaginable to describe. Um, but I'm, I think that the fact that this has persisted for so long, Democrats, Republicans, you know, pre-Vietnam, uh, post-Vietnam, uh, before segregation, after segregation, uh, indicates uh, a real deficit in the the moral culture that we uh, are 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 creating here in the United States as we move to an empire away from a republic um, and seek to dominate the world, not by example, but at the end of a bayonet. Um, I see Ed Hughes, you've got your hand up. I know Ed, uh, you and uh, earlier salons had pointed out that how with the size of our um, defense budget, how could we have anything other than endless presidential wars and Congress checked out? I mean, you always emphasize the size of the, 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 the it goes back to how much money we're spending on everything that's military. Yeah, uh, thank you, John. What, what, a, what a great discussion. The, I've spent most of my career in the federal acquisition space. And so uh, I was actually part of Paul Dembling's group at GAO Winslow that uh, rewrote the on government procurement back in 1982. Uh, and believe me, they weren't written to handle the procurements that are going on right now. But my question is this, perhaps the right question is, 
um, cui bono? Who, who's benefiting from this? And I would contend that it, the generals at the Defense Department aren't the ones that are benefiting, certainly not immediately while they're at the Defense Department. You know, the politicians up on the Hill may benefit because they get political contributions, but the people that actually make the money and from my experience actually run the show are the large uh, integration contractors, the large uh, systems acquisitions contractors. They're the ones that uh, do the hiring. They're the ones that get the money. They're the ones that spend the money. Um, and they do it lavishly in, in um, catering to their Defense Department uh, sponsors. They spend it lavishly on the Hill in catering to Congress people that um, are responsible for voting the appropriations. But you know, at a, out of an $800 billion budget, I believe uh, only about 25% goes to personnel. The rest goes to acquisitions. And that money lands in the pockets of some of the largest huh. defense contractors uh, in the country. And so they benefit. And if we wanted to reform the system, it seems to me, wouldn't it be worthwhile having a thorough investigation of their um, uh, the, the ways by which they go about procuring, acquiring government contracts. <laughs> well, that would cut to the heart of the system, I must say. Um, Obviously, uh, not an idea. Uh, I think, you know, you, you say, the general, well, the generals and admirals are making a lot of money. They, um, uh, they certainly do when they retire. I mean, um, uh, John uh, Mattis, uh, you know, was... Uh, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and then he went off to retired, and he became um, uh, he was on the board of uh, General Dynamics, made a million dollars, and then became Secretary of Defense, and then um, you know did that for a period of time, and then resigned and went back to being um, being on the board of General Dynamics. I mean, it's a very profitable business being a four-star general these days. Yeah. If I could make just two points that. One is the facetious point that we don't know how much the corporations are making because we don't audit their profits and overhead. Um, you might recall the old renegotiation commission that yeah. would annually measure profits and when it was working right, uh, require um, re re repayment for, uh, for, for excess profits. But the more important serious answer I think is that um, it's a system. Um, uh, people are at the top of it, depending on their role. Um, Ray McGovern has the wonderful acronym, Mickey Mac, uh, excuse me, Mickey Mac. It's not the industrial- uh, 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 Military industrial. Military conspiracy, it's the, oh God, here we go. Um, industrial, military, congressional, intelligence, academic, uh, media, and think tank, <laughs> think tank. Uh, problem. <laughs> um, I got one of those out of order, uh, but think of it as a system, uh, not where just one thing is running the show, but it's a system where all those operative components need to cooperate to make the system operate the way it does. But I think what ties them together is the money. They all oh, benefit. Sure. That's, that's, that's the lifeblood. And that's one so of the reasons why it's very difficult to get the kind of investigation you asked for, Ed, is Congress isn't going to go investigate the people that fund their campaigns. You know, you, you don't poison the, the source of your revenue. Uh, and that's why Congress simply doesn't do oversight anymore. There you go. Um, and, and only people uh, could, to, could donate money. That would be a significant change. We're, we're, we've run out of time now, and I see we still we have some hands up. Uh, uh, Taji from L London, uh, did uh, coup 53. I uh, see you're there. And uh, Paul Horn, I didn't know, Paul, you've become a pirate. But um, uh, Paul's on our board. Do uh, you guys want to just say something very briefly because we, we've got to sign off here. Yeah, sure. um, I'd be happy to if, if I could, John. Uh, it seems to me there is probably not enough political reaction to the military spending because a lot of it is done locally, represents a lot of local employment. 
I'm wondering if in a political social sense, if we restored universal military service, if that would waken up the awaken the public to the military budget and, and uh, abuse of military spending. <laughs> I would discourage the wars a little bit. I don't know what to do about spending. Um, the uh, military payroll for the old volunteer army is certainly high, uh, and a conscript army uh, uh, would would take a couple nicks out of that. But but uh, I don't think that would solve the problem, and I don't think the society will be go along with it. I should get the last word here. We're We've got to, we've Great. got to sign um, off. Thank you very much. Uh, it's it's one thirty a.m. here in London, and I'm very very happy to. I know stay you're. Up. Uh, it's been definitely yeah. worth staying up uh, to listen to such a distinguished panel of guests and uh, learn so much. Uh, I have a couple of very short questions. Uh, I'm an Iranian, and until the Shah uh, was overthrown in uh, 1979, he was one of U.S.'s biggest arms buyers, probably second or third biggest. Uh, my question is, who is currently the biggest buyer of military from, uh, from the US? And given that uh, the Iraq war was such a huge success and Afghanistan, both Iraq and Afghanistan living in peace and harmony with full democracy now, what are the likelihood of, what is the likelihood of uh, a war with Iran? Um, and, and the weapons purchases, I think Saudi Arabia is probably the largest purchaser right now. Um, um, Andrew's probably a better person to deal with the, the, the war question. Um, I'd love to hear what he had to say. Um, but as part of the Mickey Mat uh, working, you know, the way it does, um, get people pumped up about it. Uh, Trump certainly fell for it. Um, and uh, you can make the system work by uh, getting, you know, the people worked up about these things. Um, uh, I genuinely think, uh, I'm not a big fan of Joe Biden, but I genuinely think he doesn't want to get us involved in another war. Yeah, it'll be decided. Yeah, we brought out of Israel will decide whether we go to war to Iran, not the U.S. It depends upon uh, how frightened Israel wants to concoct one capability to to offset their 200 or 300 nuclear we don't make independent decisions on middle east when israel's involved well we, we we've run out of time thanks so much for everyone it was a great discussion and um uh as always and uh, we want to thank andrew thank you, Good night. thank you john thank you andrew and one love. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Andrew, Thank you. Thank you.